types of investing. Let's look first at CDs, money market type accounts. A CD is a certificate of deposit typically at the bank. Now I hear people walk around talking like they're, like they're somebody, there's some big investor, I've got me a CD. I'm a real, I've got CDs, I'm doing CDs. This just means nothing. A, you, you know, when you ever go to school and have perfect attendance, they gave you a certificate. That's what this is. It's a certificate that says you have a deposit. <laughs> Whoopee. Okay? You have a savings account with a frameable certificate. That's it. That's all a certificate of deposit is. Now, that's not what a real one looks like. A real one would look more like a piece of paper from a bank, right? That's an actual certificate of deposit there. And these days, most of them are done electronically. You may not even get a piece of paper. You just have a web presence. <laughs> it's a savings account that if you take your money out early, they charge you a... I don't own any CDs, not one. I'm not going to tie my money up and not get paid anything for tying it up. And that's what we end up doing with this. So I don't do that. Instead, I use money market accounts with a mutual fund company, money market mutual funds. They're low risk money market accounts with check writing privileges. So for my emergency fund, I'm making the same money you'd be making on a CD, about the same interest rate as you'd make on a six month CD in a money market account. And I can write checks against it. There's no penalty and it's just sitting there. It's not an investment though. Even then it's a savings account because we said with the emergency fund, it's not an investment, it's insurance. Smart people invest in themselves. A lot of them also tend to invest in the company that they're working for. They all invest in sound, long-term mutual funds and long-term investments. What I found is that really wealthy people started with little means, but invested systematically over a long period of time in good investments like mutual funds that have a good long-term track record. The really fascinating and odd thing is that it's not that hard. If you take a person that is 18, 19, or 20 years old, and they invest regularly over a lifetime, they can become a millionaire. You don't have to earn some amazing rate of return. You just have to be consistent and start early. There are several common traits of millionaires. They tend to work hard. They have a budget and stick to it, and they live on less than they make. They are really, really disciplined about saving and investing. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't do some fun things and spend some money, but they always make sure that they pay themselves first through saving and investing. The last and very interesting trait of millionaires is that they have fanatical integrity. That means that they are fair and honest both in business and in life. It makes sense if you think about it. If you're hardworking, disciplined, and honest, you will win in life. Single stocks, single stock investing carries an extremely high degree of risk. I do not own a single, single stock. If you're a single stock nut or you just think your company is the best company since sliced bread and you wanna buy some single stocks, you've just got to have some single stocks. You think they're the greatest thing out there and you and your golfing buddy have got this figured out and you just gotta do it. Well, no more than 10% of your nest egg. So if you have $300,000 in your 401k, you should never have more than $30,000 tied up in single stocks. And I got to tell you one more time, I know a lot about this. I've spent my life studying it. I have zero money in single stocks. I don't think it's fun. It's too risky. And you jump in and out and there's all kinds of studies that say that the average person buying and selling stocks through their broker over a period of years averages about 7%. You and your golfing buddy do not have this thing figured out. And so it's a bad idea. Mark Twain, he said it this way. He said, October, this is one of the peculiarly dangerous months to speculate in stocks. The others are July, January, September, April, November, May, March, June, December, August, and February. You're listening to the Dave Ramsey Show, America. Thank you for joining us. Coming up next is Monty. He's a junior in college, 22 years old, Pensacola, Florida. Hey, Monty, what's up in your world? Yeah, uh, not a lot. I have an uncle who does uh, day trading. And he says it's making him rich. Why don't you recommend day trading or single stocks? Because they seem to work for him. How do I say this gently, Monty? 
your uncle is an idiot? Yeah, that, well, that's that's one thing we could say. Here, here's the deal. 78% of the people who buy and sell single stocks in a given year lose money. People who say they make money day trading um, are either can't add and don't keep up with their stuff or they're 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 like it's like a fishing story that's what it's like every time he goes fishing he catches big fish i've never seen any guys like my uncle he's the best fisherman ever well no not really here's the deal 78 percent of these people lose money so the chances of him actually being the one genius give me a break if he was that dad blame smart he'd be running a mutual fund i can tell you this i've got all these degrees letters and licenses and crap after my name that says i'm supposed to know something about stocks and i do know a lot about stocks and buying and selling stocks and you know how much i buy and sell single stocks zero i'm a multimillionaire. you know why because i don't take chances like that I don't play with those kinds of things. That's too much risk. Dude, you have a better shot of standing at the roulette wheel and just the the law of random numbers making you rich than you do buying and selling single stocks. So best way to do is to find a way to get rich that is steady, predictable, low risk, and do that kind of a thing like long-term investing in good growth stock mutual funds. Hope that was clear for you, sir. We appreciate you joining us on the Dave Ramsey Show. Now, when you buy a stock, we do need to understand how this works, you are actually buying a piece of ownership in the company. You're buying a piece of ownership in the company. Let's do this this way for just a second. I'm going to open a company, and I'll tell you what, let's, uh, let's you and I open a company. What's your first name, sir? Dwayne. Dwayne. It's good to meet you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dwayne and I, as an example, are going to open a... Uh, a printing company. We're going to go in the printing business together. Okay, Dwayne knows a lot about printing. I don't know anything about it in our example. Are you in the printing business? Good. Okay, this is an example, all right? And so uh, he, he's going to come to me. I'm going to put up a little money, and he's going to go in and do the work and get the accounts and get, you know, learn about the paper and the ink and that kind of stuff. And so we decide we're going to form a corporation, and we're going to own it half and half, and we're going to issue 100 shares of stock a share of stock, and he's going to have 50 shares of stock, and I'm going to have 50 shares of stock. So we're 50-50 owners in this company. A share of stock represents a piece of ownership in that company. Dwayne and Dave's, the D&D print shop, right? Okay. And so then what happens to this company, what happens to its value and its profitability as a stock holder and owner of the company I get to participate in a winner, in winning or losing with that. If I sold a share of this stock to someone else, then as we made money or lost money, then that person would benefit. Now, how does that happen? Well, if you're an owner, think about it. If you owned your own print business, forget stock a second. If you owned a company, if the company did better, you'd be doing better, right? In a couple of different ways. Your return comes as the value, as the company increases in value. Now let's say we go along and we have one little print shop and we're winning and Dwayne's really good at this and he goes out and gets a bunch of accounts and I, I maybe do the accounting or the financial stuff over here and he's really, he, he's an excellent printer and we build up business and build up business so much so we can't fit it in that and we open up another building and pretty soon you visit us five, ten years later and we've got print shops in six different cities. Now is, is, is this one share of stock, my 50 shares of stock worth more with print shops in six or eight cities that are profitable? And I've got all that equipment? Yeah. And so that's what happens. That's how a share of stock goes up in value. If you buy a share of a company like a Home Depot or something, and it goes from $52 a share to $72 a share, it's because the company became worth more, just like our print shop. And you're a little bitty dinky sliver of an owner when you own a share of stock in a publicly traded company. Same kind of thing. Or you, the owner, can make some of the profits out. And we have D&D &D print shop, and maybe we make some money. Hey, there's an idea. And Dwayne and Dave's print shop. And maybe we, make, maybe we made $40,000 that year. Well, if we're going to take that money out, that would be called dividends. And so if you own a share of a publicly traded company and they make a profit, they may choose to issue dividends. And so you may get a check that's your little sliver of the profits for that year of that company. That's what stock ownership is. So you make money as the value of the company goes up or as it makes profits and pays out dividends. Some companies are big dividend paying companies. My grandfather, for instance, when he was alive, worked many, many years, 38 years at Alcoa Aluminum. 
And when my grandmother was alive, after my grandfather passed away, she would go, she knew which Tuesday of the month or which day of the month the dividend check was coming. He had some Alcoa stock and they were making a profit and she could go to the mailbox and there'd be a check. She didn't even really know what it was. She just knew dividends meant money. She didn't understand exactly how it all worked, but she cashed those checks, I'll tell you that. And so she was making a little, as Alcoa Aluminum made money in those days, she participated. He participated in the profits by getting dividends checks. Now, bonds are a debt instrument by which the company owes you money. Now again, let's go back to Dwayne and Dave's print shop. Now you know that if Dwayne and Dave, the D&D print shop, if I'm involved, we're not borrowing money, but we gotta do this as an example, okay? Let's say that we wanted to borrow $10,000. If we were a publicly traded company, we could issue a bond. And what's your first name, sir? Stan. Stan, it's good to meet you, sir. Let's say Stan, he really kind of liked what we were doing over there at the print company, it looked pretty good to him. He knew we weren't really gonna cut him in as an owner, but he trusted us to be able to pay the bill. And so we issue a bond for $10,000 to Stan, and he gives me $10,000. Come on, Stan. <laughs> Come on, baby, okay? And he gives us $10,000. Now, we owe him a debt of $10,000. Does that make sense? That's what a bond is. It's a debt instrument. The, if it's a government bond, the government owes you a debt if you own a government bond. That's what it is. A bond is a debt instrument. Now, the way you make money on bonds is there's an interest rate involved. Stan wouldn't have given us that money if we weren't gonna pay him interest, right? So we're gonna pay him interest on it. Now let's say just for simplification that we were paying 10% on our bonds. And if we pay 10%, then Stan's gonna make 10% on this. And at some point this has a due date. We have to give him the whole 10,000 back. But in the meantime, every year we're sending him 10% on this $10,000 bond. And that's all it is. So your return comes on a bond. And again, you get a little, little certificate thing like that. Your return comes as the fluctuation in price and the interest rate is paid. So at, bonds go up and down in price and few individuals do well with single bond purchases. Now let me take this just a little bit further and walk over into the very edge of sophistication. I can't even say it, see? And so let's say that we have a 10% bond that I'm paying him 10% in the open market and the stock market, right? Stocks and bonds, you've heard about this, okay? I'm paying him 10%. Let's say that the interest rates around the world are starting to average 12%, but his bond only entitles him to 10%. Is his bond worth a little less or a little more if everybody else is getting 12 and he's only getting 10? He's worth less. So as interest rates rise, bond prices fall. There's an inverse relationship. So if your grandmother has a whole bunch of government bonds that she's purchased thinking they're safe and interest rates are going up, she's starting to lose value in those and can do so pretty quickly if interest rates shift quickly. And so I don't like bonds, not because of that. They're just as risky as stocks. They jump around all over the place. They're a little safer than stocks, but the bond market throughout its lifetime has only averaged about 8%. So I don't own a single bond. I don't want to make 8% on that. I might end up making a mess like I'm doing right now. That could happen. So again, few individuals do well with single bond purchases.